happy National Nano Day. My name is Lori and I'm coming to you live from one of the labs at Berkeley Labs Molecular Foundry. The Foundry is a user facility that enables researchers from all over the world to come here to work with our scientists and to use our tools in nanoscience research. Nanoscience is a big field focused on the very small. It's every field at the nanoscale, covering biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, medicine, and more. One nanometer equals 10 to the minus 9 meters. That's why we celebrate Nano Day on October 9th. If I had nanoparticles that were 10 nanometers in size, I would need 1,000 of them stacked up together in order to get something that's as wide as a single hair. At the nanoscale, researchers can explore materials' properties, learn to control them, or even create new materials altogether. The possibilities are endless. Now we have some of the foundry scientists here to talk about their research. First, we have Emery Tan, who's going to talk to us a little bit about a special kind of nanoparticle called quantum dots. Emery? Thanks, Lori. My name is Emery Chan, and I study nanocrystals. So nanocrystals are like little tiny rocks. I have a model of a nanocrystal here, and it's a crystal because its atoms are arranged in very ordered arrays. So this is my favorite nanocrystal, cadmium selenide. So in cadmium selenide, the yellow pieces of plastic are the cadmium atoms, and the black bits are selenium. So again, they're ordered in these nice hexagons, but this is just a model of a nanocrystal. A real nanocrystal would be really, really small. So this would be anywhere from 1 to 10 nanometers wide. So again, that's like 10,000 times smaller than a human hair, or it's like if hair had hair, it would be this wide. So why do we study such small materials? Well, it's because nanoparticles and other nanomaterials, their properties change with their size. So their properties are like their color or how hard they are. So for a real big nanoparticle or a big piece of material, if I cut this plastic in half, it would still look yellow and black. But for nanoparticles, actually their color changes with their size. And if you don't believe me, well, I have some real nanoparticles sitting here. Um, so these are many, many nanoparticles swimming around in a liquid because real nanoparticles are too small to see with a human eye. So if I have six nanometer particles, um, they look red. Um, but if I chop those nanoparticles in half and make them three nan nanometer particles, then they look green. So these particles have the exact same atoms and they have the exact same arrangement of atoms. The only difference is their size. So that's really, really strange. And so as scientists, we study why this happens. We answer the question why. And so if you'd like to know why nanoparticles change color with their size, you can either study nanoscience or you can ask questions um, from me or Sinead, who's coming up. All right. Thank you very much, Emery. So now we're going to talk with Sinead Griffin, who's going to tell us about quantum mechanical cal calculations and dark matter. Welcome, Sinead. Thanks, Larry. So I'm a real-life quantum mechanic. What that means is that I use quantum mechanics to try and figure out how and why materials act the way they do. To do this, we need three key ingredients. The first thing we need is to know what types of elements and atoms we have in our crystal. The second thing we need is where these are. So we need a three-dimensional map of where all of these atoms are in the material. And the final thing we need is the magic. That's the quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanics describes how these different atoms interact with each other in the material. So once we have these three things, the elements or the atoms in the material, where they are or our three-dimensional map, and how these different atoms talk to each other in the material, we can go ahead and describe and design how a material will actually behave. The types of things we can know about are whether or not a material is magnetic or not, how the electricity flows through the material, and even what color a material will be. Now, this might sound a bit straightforward, but it's not as easy as that. To solve the equations that govern this material, we don't need just one blackboard. In fact, a whole football stadium of blackboards isn't enough. We actually need to send our calculations to supercomputers to solve it, where we need hundreds and thousands of cores of the supercomputer to figure out what this material does. Once the supercomputers are finished with their calculations, it will tell us what the properties of the materials are, like whether or not it's a magnet or what color it is. Now, many of the uses of these materials are things that we know about in our everyday lives, for example, in the batteries of our phones or in the electronics in our pockets. 
However, a more intriguing and interesting application of these quantum mechanical calculations is to describe and design materials that will detect the very elusive and mysterious dark matter. Here I have a picture of what dark matter is believed to look like in the early universe. And in fact, you can actually see in this picture there is a structure behind dark matter. But in real life, dark matter is dark. We can't see it because it doesn't interact with light the way normal materials do. In fact, it doesn't really interact with many things at all. We can design materials using our quantum mechanical codes that will be able to detect dark matter by dark matter bumping into it, just like if you wake up in bed at night, stumble out of bed and bang into something. All of the existing efforts to detect dark matter are based around this. We try and detect dark matter by how it bumps into real materials. And this is part of what quantum mechanics is useful for, for unearthing these early questions about the origins of our universe. All right, sorry. Thanks, Sinead. All right, now we're going to go to you, the audience, to answer some of your questions about nanoscience. Uh, first, from Hercules High School, we have a question that says, what are some everyday materials that, or everyday things that have nanomaterials in them? So one of the things that everyone carries around in their pockets is their mobile phone. So in fact, the batteries in our mobile phones, the screens in our mobile phones are all made of nanomaterials. Also, some uh, medical applications have nanomaterials in them because these are really, really tiny so that they can be sensed exactly in the body where we want them to go. Nice. Also, TVs and iPads also have nanoparticles. So you can see here that these nanoparticles will glow different colors. So in your TV screens, you need phosphors that glow different colors. And so now you might see these quantum dot TVs or these, you know, Amazon Kindle nano screens that have these quantum dots. Nanoscience is everywhere. All right, our next question is, what is the smallest thing that you've ever studied and what tools did you use to study it? So for me, the smallest thing I've ever studied is a collection of atoms together, which is really nanometers in size. And as I explained earlier, to actually study these nanomaterials, what I use is supercomputers and performing experiments inside the computer to try and predict what materials, properties these things have. How about you, Emery? Smallest thing I've ever studied is about two nanometers. So nanoparticles are really hard to see. You can't see them with your eyes, so we need really powerful microscopes. Um, and even then, you have so few atoms inside a two nanometer particle, it's really hard to see anyway. So that's the limit about for what we can see in what we can study in nanoparticle world. Well, so far at least. So far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question coming in from Hercules High School. Are a lot of companies investing in nanotechnology and do they use the molecular foundry? So um, a lot of companies are invested in nanotechnology because um, even your computer chips, the wires inside of your computer chips are about 10 nanometers wide. And um, it's a good question that people, whether people use the molecular foundry. So a lot of startup companies will use the molecular foundry because they can come and, for example, use all the different microscopes and equipment that we have here instead of buying their own. Yeah, and it's not just technological applications like microelectronics where it's useful. It's also used in, in biology and chemistry and physics and all areas of science. So um, companies that span this whole breadth of different applications come here and use the facilities at the foundry. All right, our next question, what is one of the big mysteries of the nano world that you hope to help solve? All right, who wants to go first? Sure, well, I'm going to go first All right. because I want to find dark matter. Um, no one has found it yet, and qu um, quantum mechanics and nanoscience might actually play a really key vital role in designing the materials that might actually detect dark matter. So that would actually answer one of the biggest open questions in physics right now. Nice. How about you, Emery? So I'd like to solve the fundamental challenge of how to put an atom in a nanocrystal in a very specific place um, and not in any, any other place. For example, I'd like to take this nanocrystal and say, well, this atom I want to replace you know, this cadmium with, for example, an erbium atom. And then I want to actually see that erbium atom in the middle of the cadmium at nanocrystal um, using a really powerful microscope. So we're just starting to be able to do this, but being able to do that in a massive scale so that we can make all sorts of different nanoparticles for different applications, that would be the real killer app for nanoscience. Nice. All right, next question, again from Hercules High School. Is nanotech really expensive, and is there 
is there going to be a big industry for it in the future? That's a really great question. Actually, part of the reason we use theory and computation is because doing that actually doing the experiments slightly cheaper because we can do them inside our computer before we do them in the lab. So what we need to do our experiments in the computer are very large supercomputing centers, but it does give us an advantage over having a full laboratory full of chemicals and expensive equipment, which will then help out with the experimentalists in guiding them in their work. So nanotech does not have to be expensive in terms of how much it costs to make them. So one of the first applications was nano fabrics that were stain resistant um, and those are just essentially made out of plastic or just everyday materials. Um, now the research into nanoscience is very time consuming. It takes a lot of effort by scientists at the foundry and other places, um, but once you actually have the technology, it can be made very cheaply. All right, our next question coming in. Uh, what was your first experience in nanoscience? And what interested you in it? So when I was in high school, I did an internship at Carnegie Mellon University um, studying very thin films for hard disk drives. And also when I was in college, I studied carbon nanotubes, which are really tiny nanoscale wires. So those made me really excited about nanoscience and um, encouraged me to go to graduate school to study nanoscience. Yeah, similar to Emory, I did a, a summer internship in UC Santa Barbara. and. Uh, there I was looking at thermoelectric materials. These are really cool materials that take waste heat and generate electricity from it. So that was my first experience of how uh, physics and equations and quantum mechanics can be used for something very useful. Very cool. All right, another question coming in from Hercules High School. Why don't we just use nanoscience in everything? <laughs> But well, we do use nanoscience in many different things. So nanoscience is just a general description for science that happens on the scale of tens of atoms. And that, that applies to most of life, right? The proteins in your body are around that size. Or for example, um, the, the wires in your computer chips in your phone are that size. So we are using nanoscience. Uh, we just don't see it every day because it's so small. Yeah, and also we've been just developing the scientific tools and technology that enable us to control materials at the nanoscale. So it's also keeping up with existing technology and scientific discovery um, is why we, we don't use it in everything yet. All right. Well, it looks like we're about out of time. So thank you very much for tuning in to our first ever live stream from the Molecular Foundry. And I hope you have a very happy National Nano Day. <laughs>